Welcome to the MPW Student Faculty Reading Series. Um, I'm Tom, as you know from previous series. Rakina is gone tonight, and so tonight we're doing something different. We have special guest MCs tonight. So with that, I will turn this night over to PT and Ebony. Thanks for coming. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ebony Cunningham. And I'm P.T. McNiff. And Hi. we are your stand-in MCs for this evening. This is a monthly reading series that is, has been developed and curated and hosted by our students, two of them in uh, specifically, Tom Rastrelli, who's here on the end. Wave, Tom. Who will be reading tonight, so we gave him a little break. And then Rakina Joseph, who actually is at the Jay-Z concert tonight. <laughs> so we allowed her to go <clears throat> to that as well. So we are from the USC Master of Professional Writing program. And to tell those who don't know about the program a little bit about us, we're a multi-genre creative writing program. And so we have uh, several different emphases emphases. Mm -hmm. uh, we have nonfiction, fiction, writing for stage and screen and poetry. So our students get to dabble in a little bit of everything. So if you're interested in that or know someone who might be, uh, give me a holler in the back and we have some brochures around uh, today. And uh, we do a lot of great things at the MPW program, so one of which TT, uh, PT is going to tell you about right now. Uh, sure, so um, just give you a little more plugging about our program. Some of the things we do include, there's a, a literary journal uh, that uh, some of the people who are here today uh, edit, uh, and we, uh, it's, it uh, mirrors the multi-genre approach of the program itself, so it's got fiction, nonfiction, poetry, uh, stage and screen writing as well, uh, and copies of that are available through our website. If you uh, pick up a brochure, uh, you are invited to go and order it, because we would be happy if you did. Uh, and in addition, we, uh, we also, some, uh, a lot of the students in the program are going to be going to the uh, AWP Associated Writing Programs uh, conference in Denver, and uh, we've been doing some various fundraising events and uh, actions to uh, help pay for us lowly graduate students to go and do that. Uh, and we'll be doing something related to that later. That's just a little like that's like a teaser to let you know something will be coming up later. But we're going to get to the readings now. Enough plugging. Uh, and uh, Ebony, would you like to begin? So first, we have Rob. Vote. Oh yes, let's uh, let's do a reminder about cell phones. Please turn off all your cell phones or put them on silent, mm -hmm. uh, and anything that might make noise, pacemakers, so that we don't disturb <laughs> our jittery legs, uh, <laughs> tap disturb shoes. our readers today. And let me also tell you quickly about parking validation is over here on the right before you leave. Make sure to get your pass uh, validated. So our first reader is Rob Vogt, and he's a first year, second semester fiction student at MPW. And uh, going in the, in the theme of tonight, which is uh, rights and wrongs of passage, uh, we, asked, uh, we asked all the readers uh, what the craziest, most interesting, or most moving thing you ever did to join a group uh, was or is. And, uh, and his answer was that he cut down a tree that smashed through a second floor window of a fraternity house at Indiana University. Now Good something Rob. you, you <laughs> may not know also about Rob is that David Hasselhoff and Rob attended the same Chicago area high school, but of course at different times. Yeah, uh, and he wants to make sure that it's emphasized to uh, all collected here that he is a Rob, he's not a Robert, he goes by Rob. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Vogt. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I, uh, I taught junior high school for 10 years, so the offensive things I've been called, more so than Robert, I'm good to go. So that's not, it's not bad at all, PT. Um, I wrote a short story a couple years ago, and it uh, sent it out to different journals. It was uh, rejected 63 times in a row. Yeah, you can clap or laugh or, yeah. Um, finally, the 64th editor knew great literature when she saw it. So um, it was published last spring. The name of the story is Sox Park. It's set in uh, 1976. It's a seven-year-old boy and his father go to a baseball game on the south side of Chicago. And the short excerpt I'm going to read takes place when the boy's father convinces him to walk down to the field to try to get a baseball as a souvenir. The boy walks quickly, but not too quickly, because he needs time to figure out if he should be nervous or not. 
He walks past an usher wearing the navy blue suit and cap of an airline pilot, whose eyes are glazed over with more important things than preventing a seven-year-old from getting an honest-to-God souvenir. The boy has to look down at the ground more than usual because the concrete steps leading to the field are longer and flatter than ones you find anywhere else. Tears, really, more than steps. But with every quick upward glance, the field gets closer and closer. From here, the green grass is a little more patchy than it looks from their seats. The infield dirt a little less smooth, a little more spike marked. It's the longest walk through unfamiliar territory the boy has taken since walking to kindergarten just two years ago, and yet somehow he arrives at the wall sooner than he expected to. There's a kind of hot tightness just below his belly that makes him wish he'd gone to the bathroom earlier in the game. It takes the boy several moments to locate the White Sox player with the extra baseball, because the sight lines are totally different at this level. Turning his head all the way to the side, he sees the player casually firing the ball to the left fielder, the way big leaguers do in person the ball coming out of his hand with shocking speed for such an easy motion. While the gentle arc in reality covers only 60 feet or so, to the boy it goes on forever. Before the boy knows it, the bench player is jogging toward him, toward the dugout actually, and he gets bigger and bigger with every step, his face pockmarked like the infield dirt. The, sins, the thin circus font Chicago on the front of the jersey is bigger than the boy expected. Even bigger is the jersey's pointed tab collar that gives the White Sox the look of a tavern-sponsored 16-inch softball team. Here, 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 the boy yells, because it's the only word he can come up with. And a bolt of electricity shoots through his body when the outfielder makes eye contact and lobs the ball toward him. The red stitches rotate and the ball gets bigger, and time seems to slow down until the ball is almost within catching range. And then both the ball and time speed up and someone pushes the boy from behind, he bangs his chin against the concrete wall and loses sight of the ball altogether, and then he is down. He cries out in pain and looks up to see the sky and a little bit of the upper deck above him. Once again, the sight lines are way off. The boy lifts his head and tries to sort out all of his seven-year-old limbs. His eyes sting with tears, but he fights them back, because right now the idea of crying in front of people he doesn't know is scarier than a little blood on his chin. Unfolding himself to full height, he sees an older, taller boy running up the steps, his arm outstretched above his head, his hand clutching the baseball that the White Sox player just threw into the stands. When the older boy gets back to the section that houses his seat, he high-fives several people in the row. He wears a pair of light blue jean shorts and a black t-shirt with the sleeves cut off, his pale arms starting to show the curved hints of triceps. His father is a fat man in similar shorts and a white old-style t-shirt. And after he high-fives his son, he says something that the boy cannot hear. It must be funny, though, because the rest of the row laughs. And it is at this point, with the combination of being knocked down and then laughed at, that the boy bursts into tears. He starts back up the steps toward the seat, moving much faster on the way down and not caring whether he trips and falls. But before the boy gets back to his seat, he runs into his father, who grabs him by the shoulder, spins him around, and starts the trip back down toward the field. And now things seem to be happening faster and clearer than they normally do. When the two arrive at the row containing the boy who took the ball that could have belonged, should have belonged, had to belong to the boy, his father horses his way down the knee-crowded aisle, using the bullish strength he has built up over a decade of moving furniture for a living. Several of the fans nearby yelp and protest, but the boy's father does not stop. When he gets to the boy with the cut-off t-shirt and, and faint triceps, he grabs the baseball, then turns and underhand tosses it to his son. The older boy looks more shocked than angry, and his father rises in protest. What the hell are you doing? The fat man says. That's my son's ball. Come on, he couldn't even catch the damn thing. Suddenly, people in the row are laughing again. And what makes it worse this time is they're not only laughing at the boy, but also at his father. Sensing momentum, the fat man speaks to his own son. Johnny, go get your ball back. And much like the boy starting to cry when the high-fiving began, it is at this particular moment that something deep inside the boy's father clicks. Something primal, something about being dismissed as an empty threat, something about not being enough of a man to defend his own family. And once he feels the click, the boy's father cocks his meaty right fist behind his ear and smacks the fat man in the face. The fat man stumbles backwards sideways, one of his milky white knees bobbing toward the surface of the row as he falls. Three men seated nearby are suddenly on their feet, cluttering the tight space between the rows of seats. The boy's father strains against two of these men, the muscles in his neck taut like steel cables. How about that? The boy's father yells at the still prone man. You think my kid could have caught that one? A cluster of Chicago cops arrives at the scene, 
pushing past the airline pilot usher and hurting the boy's father out into the open. Wrestling his hands behind his back, two cops snap a pair of handcuffs on the boy's father's wrists. What the hell, the boy's father yells. You got the wrong guy. A smattering of applause from nearby fans turns the feeling in the boy's once tight stomach into a dull, cold ache. A third cop turns to look at the boy. Hey, pal, is that your old man? That's my dad, the boy says quietly. Well, come on. The cop jerks his head toward the boy's father, who's being forcibly marched up the aisle. You gotta come too. Once everybody reaches the top of the steps, things go from very bright and overly green to dark again. The boy's eyes do not adjust immediately, so he can barely make out the silhouette of his father being snowballed down the interior ramp. At ground level, the cops throw him into a small cell with a chain link fence as its outside wall. Initially, the boy's father stumbles, then rights himself and pushes his face against the fence. Several strands of hair curl girlishly across his forehead, and the boy wishes his father were not in handcuffs so he could push those strands back into place and make everything right again. His father's face is red, and angry spittle leaks out of the corner of his mouth. Let me out of here, he yells. The caretaker cop nudges the boy's shoulder. Come on, pal. A holding cell's no place for a kid. The two of them cross the walkway to a spot 50 feet away from their original location. While the boy can still see his father and hear his father, he can no longer interact with his father, and the ache in his stomach grows even colder. Rob Vogt, everybody. Again, give it a Our next reader is uh, a second year student uh, concentrating in fiction, Ms. Kelly Moore. Something crazy about Kelly is that it was her tradition in the college improv group that she was in for graduating seniors to chug a bottle of Clamato, which in case you don't know, is a delightful concoction of tomato and clam juice on stage during their final show. So she's ashamed to say that she couldn't finish the entire bottle, but she's proud of the fact that she managed not to puke. Uh, and something that you may not know about her is that uh, she once had dinner in a real Japanese tea house where she was served by a real Japanese geisha. I don't know what makes them real, but, <laughs> but that's what happened. Welcome Kelly Moore. Kelly Moore. Um, I know I'm push pushing the upper limits of my uh, time limit here, so I'm not going to give too much of an introduction to this piece other than to say that it's an excerpt from the novel that I'm working on for my thesis in the program. Um, and one of the characters in my piece has a Haitian accent, and I'm going to do my best with it, but apologies to anybody if you or your family is Haitian and I completely maim your accent. <laughs> Growing up, my family consisted of me, my father, a three-legged dog named Nikon, and almost a dozen political refugees from every dictator-led, unstable, genocidal, civil war-torn corner of the globe. We called them the strays. Mrs. Hazel moved into the house when I was seven. She was a thick, dark brown Haitian woman with large, slightly crossed eyes. She made all her own clothes from brightly colored cloths and wore her hair in tiny braids, which spiraled and zigzagged around her head like the strokes of a Van Gogh painting. The end of each braid was tipped with colored beads, which she changed regularly to match her outfits. These beads fascinated me, especially the clinking rain stick noise they made when Mrs. Hazel turned her head. I would follow her around when she moved through the house, just listening to the swish of her long dress, the soft padding of, the rough, of her rough bare feet on the wooden floor, and the staccato tinkling of her beads, every part of her body moving in euphonious concert. When she first moved into the house, Mrs. Hazel pretended I didn't exist, looking over my head when I was in the room and ignoring me when I stuck under the table at ding dinner and fingering the fringe on her long dresses as she ate. Not bad of me, she'd say, kicking me away with her callous toes like an unwanted mutt, but I would creep right back over, and eventually my persistent curiosity wore her out. At first, I was just allowed to curl up in her lap as she watched TV with the other strays, but soon I was allowed into her room to watch her change the beads, then given the honor of helping her choose the bead colors. And finally, she trusted me to change the beads myself. As I worked, she would lean her head back and tell me stories that fell into one of two categories. Fables that she knew from her childhood about sly, trickster gods, hapless humans, and magical jungle animals, and anecdotes from her job as a phone psychic. Oh, Nadi, you would not imagine the poor man who called me last night. He love a woman who no love him back. 
She would shake her head and tell me about the caller's woes. As she spoke, she would take sips from a grimy bike water bottle, the kind with the little tab on the top that you pull open with your teeth. She said her throat got sore when she talked so much, so she needed to drink water while she told stories. The more she drank, however, the glassier her eyes would become, and the more deeply her accent would sway. He buys she a ring and gonna propose tomorrow. Miss Hazel would bite open the top of the water bottle and squirt its contents into her mouth. Will she say yes? I was always so sure this would be the story that would finally have a happy ending. Jeanne, she sleep with the cashier at Safeway and she pregnant. I would sigh and pull the next braid on her head a little harder than necessary, angry that she couldn't make up a happy ending for once. Mrs. Hazel had the ability, which she considered a curse, to actually see people's futures. I asked her once to tell mine, but she laughed and shook her head. It only work out a phone naughty, she explained, as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. I could call you. She rolled the brows down over her crossed eyes. Nah, I no speak on the phone except when I work. Why not? She took a long suck at the bottle, forcing the plastic cylinder to contract so completely that the sides touched. The bottle whined and gurgled as air slipped in to replace the recently disposed of liquid. I put in three new beads before she was done drinking. She let out a long, satisfied burp and placed the bottle back on the floor. Whose turn is it to make dinner tonight? You guineas. I pressed my lips into a pout, but she ignored them. Ah, good. He make those delicious potato pierogies. They so... Mm -mm. She shook her braids free of my fingers. The conversation was over. A week later, I tried to trick her. I spent six days and eternity for someone whose life has barely that many years in it, doing surveillance and gathering data, trying to find out her psychic phone number. She never let it slip and never handed out business cards. She barely talked about work with anyone but me. I finally got a break when my father asked me to distribute the mail for him. It was early spring at the time and still pretty chilly, so I ran from the front porch to the mailbox, leaping from one rugged chunk of concrete to the next, not wanting my big toe, which stuck out through the hole in my left sock, to get wet from the melted frost grass. I pulled down the metal flop of the flap at the front of the box and stood on the tips of my toes, using my hands to help pull me up and peer inside. There were five envelopes that day. I pushed my tiny arm in as far into the box as I could and pulled them out one by one. Two bills for my father, a letter for Sharif, a newsletter for Mr. Shi, and a paycheck for Mrs. Hazel. I quickly looked left and right, checking to make sure no one was watching. The return address was from Savannah, Georgia. It was printed in tiny serif letters under the name of the company, Moon Sears Hotline, LLC. I couldn't pass this up. I closed my eyes and repeated the name over and over in my head, chiseling it into my tiny memory, then walked back up to the front porch and into the house to distribute the mail, my whole body prickling in anticipation. When all the letters were distributed, I stole away to my father's bedroom where there was a phone. I was clever enough to know that someone out there would be able to tell me the phone number if I knew the name of the business. Now who could I call? I picked up the pen and paper my father kept on his nightstand and brought them over to the small table that housed the phone. I climbed up into the big straight-backed armchair and kneeled, chewing on the cap of the, uh, cap of the pen as I'd seen my father do when he needed to think hard. 911 was for emergencies, and while in my mind this constituted one, I was pretty sure it wasn't on the same scale as a fire or a burglary. If I called Nana and Papa, they would get upset and wonder what my father was doing allowing me to call phone psychics. Mrs. Attell, my teacher at school, might know the answer, but I didn't have her phone number, so that ruled her out. I had nearly chewed a hole in the plastic cap when I remembered the jingle from a television commercial. On the phone, dial 411. It's your best source for information. I pressed the green plastic numbers into the phone, and a robotic female voice came on the line. Name and city, please. I told her, and she ryth ryth rhythmically recited back ten numbers. I scratched each one into the notepad, my, heavy handwriting, uh, my he handwriting heavy and strained as my newly trained fingers traced each circle and line as accurately as I had been taught in school. I folded the paper in half three times and stuffed it into my sock. I didn't have any pockets. Before placing the pen and pad back on my father's nightstand and returning to my own room to wait until after ten o'clock that night when I knew Mrs. Hazel turned on her line. There were only two phones I was allowed to use, the one in my father's bedroom and the one in the kitchen, which was available to any of the strays who didn't want to have to pay to have their own line installed, which was all of them except Mrs. Hazel, whose company paid. I didn't want anyone to catch me lingering in the kitchen, waiting for my for turn on the phone so late at night, because that would certainly raise suspicions. My solution was something only a small childhood could have created and subsequently endured. I resolved to tuck myself away in the broom closet just off the kitchen and wait. 
The original period door had long since been destroyed and had been replaced with one of those mid-century closet contraptions, which folds in the center and hosts angled slats that allow clothing, or in my case, a small girl, to breathe. I was not yet as tall as the broom, so could comfortably stand in the small space. Once the door was closed and latched, I, could, I was also able to just twist my body 90 degrees and sink into a sitting position, with my legs pulled up to my chest. Shortly after my father retired that evening, around 9.30, I announced loudly that I was going to bed as well and stomped up the front staircase, my stocking feet not making nearly as nice of a clomping sound as I would have liked. I should have worn the traditional Dutch clogs I'd received for my birthday the previous year. After brushing my teeth and closing the door to my room with a resonant slam, I snuck myself back downstairs using the dumbwaiter positioned at the end of the hallway. Originally intended to allow, de to allow downstairs servants to easily transport meals to upstairs servants and vice versa, it had not been used as anything more than a childhood plaything since my grandparents bought the house in the late 1940s. And so, in this manner, I was able to sneak myself downstairs without anyone noticing. The dumbwaiter led out in the back hallway, right across from the broom closet, and just outside the kitchen and its coveted phone. All I had to do was lower myself and then listen very carefully. When I heard that the coast was clear, I bolted from one tiny hiding place to the next and settled myself in to wait. Just a few moments after I had successfully nestled myself between the mops and brooms, Mr. Shi came into the kitchen to use the phone. Shortly on his heels, Tatiana dialed and proceeded to have a 45-minute conversation with her sister in Georgia. If I squinted and bobbed my head up and down, I could just make out the kitchen clock through the slats. It was nearly 11 when she finally said goodbye and went off to her own room. I sat in silence for a few moments, listening to the house settle in for the night. The water running in both the upstairs and downstairs bathrooms. The scuffle of bare feet over rugs and hardwood. The final clicking of door latches and, night switch and light switches. When the only remaining sound was the ticking of the kitchen clock's second hand, I made my move. I dashed across the tile floor and slid to a stop below the buttery touch tone. My heart whirred inside my ribcage like an egg beater, and I propped my leg up against the counter and slid the paper out of my sock. I took down the receiver and dialed, pressing and holding each number harder and longer than was necessary, wanting to make sure that each digit registered. As I released the final six, I bolted back to the broom closet, stretching the long, spiraling yellow cord as far as it would go. Moonsia's hotline, this is Miss Hazel. What medical problem can I help you with on this long and lonely evening? I cleared my throat and lowered my voice. I decided to disguise myself as much as possible by pretending to be a man. <clears throat> My friend said I should talk to you. He said you could read the future. There was a pause on the other end of the line. Who dis? My name is Mike Bones. I spent several hours earlier that afternoon coming up with the perfect moniker. How old is you, Mr. Bones? I chose a number that seemed unfathomably large. I am 21 years old. <coughs> yeah, me too. Hang on there just a moment, Mr. Bones. There was a soft click, and a soothing Ocean Noises soundtrack replaced her voice. I was wondering what could possibly be more important than my phone call when a sharp yank on the phone cord wrenched the handset from my fingers and slammed open the closet door. The phone slid across the floor. I peeked through the slats to see the large, round figure of Mrs. Hazel lumbering towards me. I scuttled to my feet and wrenched the door closed. To my chagrin, there was no lock. Miss Hardy, Na Naughty Huxley, you've been a tray bad girl. She placed her face up against the slats, her cross eyes bulging out of their sockets, trying to reach in opposite directions through the tiny openings and grab me. I flattened my body back against the wall of the closet, hoping the house would absorb me into its structure and I could disappear. Her thick plantain fingers snatched for the door handle as her enormous gnashing teeth snarled at me through the far too flimsy slats. I balled my fist, clenched my eyes shut, and prayed for deliverance, but the fingers found their target and the door swung open, revealing her full stature. She grabbed my shoulder with one hand and scooped me out of the closet, my little limbs swinging and kicking like wind chimes in a dust bowl, fighting heedlessly to escape. She carried me at arm's length like a stinky diaper up the front stairs into my own bedroom, where she dangled me just inches above the bed. You ain't want to mess with Juju girl. That no one good for, good for nobody know how. She shook me as if to add a punctuation mark to the end of her sentence. Come prom. I wobbled my head up and down in small frantic nods. She released me and I tumbled to the mattress, bouncing a few times before my body finally came to a rest. Mrs. Hazel wiped her hands together as if she'd just swept up a large mess and turned to go. Did you see it? Did you see my future? I clutched a pillow to my chest as a shield as the words tumbled out of my foolishly overeager lips. Mrs. Hazel turned to me and raised both hands to the side of her face like claws. Her eyes caught the moonlight dripping in from the skylight and set it alight like gasoline. 
It was the first time I understood what someone meant when they talked about the devil. I slammed my eyes shut and buried my whole tiny body beneath the pillow shield. When I finally had the courage to peek out 15 minutes later, Mrs. Hazel had disappeared. We never mentioned that night ever again. Thank you. Kelly Moore, again, ladies and gentlemen. And next we will hear from Sharice Keck. She's, oh, Tom Rastrelli. Sorry, I can't read apparently. Tom Rastrelli is a first year nonfiction student in MPW. Uh, the craziest rite of passage that uh, he's ever taken part in is uh, at an ornate and intricate ceremony, he signed an oath saying he could no longer err from the teachings of the Catholic Church uh, and promised never to have sex again. Uh, there's, there's no information here on how exactly that turned out. But, uh, but yeah, so whatever he says goes. And he also played the Beast in a musical production of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Aww. And uh, whenever anybody asks um, what he's up to, he likes to tell people that he's currently in the 23rd grade. Please so, welcome. The, the once and future host of the reading series, Mr. Tom Rastrelli. All right, so I am going to be reading two uh, short pieces of memoir. Cordially invited, an homage to the U.S. CCB. Men in black suits. Men that had been charged with a mission stood beneath the dropped ceiling and fluorescent lighting of the small hotel conference room, bitching about the early morning hour, telling inside jokes, and discussing the week's politics. They passed the time waiting for the guests of honor to arrive. Who's coming? What was yours named again? What's he looking for? He's a definite closet case into Opus Dei and Mother Angelica, so you stay away from him. Thank goodness mine's a liberal. Yeah, liberal with the altar boys. Is my rabbi straight? The president of the conference is coming? Oh my god, I should have polished my shoes. Does anyone see a cufflink? A gold crucifix cufflink? We were men in black clerics, and this was our mission. Hobnob with the members of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops who were in Washington, D.C. for their yearly conference. We had one goal only, get them to send more meat to the seminary. The year was 2001. Two months before, the clergy sexual abuse crisis burst wide open in Boston and spread with manifest destiny across the nation and was reborn into a global pandemic. Things were more relaxed, naive, and bishops were still open to using the more liberal-minded seminaries like ours, St. Mary's, a.k.a. the Pink Palace. Loyal bishops were the lifeblood of our seminary. It was they who entrusted their vulnerable, amniotic seminarians to the formational gestation of the seminary's faculty. The number of vocationally fertilized was dwindling, thanks to the priest shortage, and our rector was desperate for the bishop's fresh mutton. Every year, on the Thursday morning of the USCCB's annual meeting, he booked a conference room and treated the bishops to an exquisite breakfast. One thing that every cleric loves, even more than free porn, is a free meal. The way to a bishop's heart is food. And of course, strapping young seminarians flitting about drunk on the church's salvific mission. Those of us present were gleaned from the student body by the rector according to certain parameters. First chosen were the sole seminarians representing a diocese. They were the last best hope for continuing the diocese's dying ontological line at the seminary. These diocesan orphans were charged with one task only, sell your bishop on the seminary at all costs. Next chosen were the handsomest seminarians. Nothing impresses a crusty, repressed, celibate bishop more than hot boys desperate for Holy Father's attention. These seminarians were charged with the task of winning new bishops to the fold. Conservative guys went for the conservative bishops, liberals for the liberals. Theological inbreeding was forbidden. As for the ugly ducklings from dioceses with multiple diocesan brothers, they were left behind at the seminary, full of rejection and resentment. I was chosen to go every year, 
and every year after the breakfast ball was over, after the homoerotic energy of the clerical courting diminished, and after our rector pimp congratulated us on a job well done, we returned to our chartered bus for the rush hour ride back up to Baltimore. Outside the Bishop's Hotel, a 24-hour vigil of three or four gay Catholic men stood silently, wrapped in winter coats, holding candles, and protesting the church's damning teachings concerning homosexuals. Passing the protesters, I wasn't the only seminarian averting my eyes, afraid that if I looked a gay in the eye that he would know that the truth of his glare would strip away my clerical shield and that I would be proclaimed a known homosexual. The damn bus took forever to pull away, and I sat there, every year, from behind the safety of the reflecting bus windows, avoiding the homo-omnipotent eyes of the courageously grieved gay protesters. No one on the bus spoke of them. We just stared, silently accepting their judgment. Then we were whisked back to the safety of the seminary, the homoerotic dormitory, and the corresponding compartments of our collective clerical closet. Why I Hate Mustaches, The Sacrament of Reconciliation, and PTSD. <laughs> Through Windex-spattered lenses, I stare at my grass-stained Reeboks and the floor of the rectangular office. The gray carpeting is immaculate, not a blade of fresh-cut September grass, shred of paper, or dust flake to be found anywhere. I know, because I'm both janitor and lawn boy of the Red Brick Catholic Student Center. The extra cash pays rent on my studio apartment, and, the cleaning, the church gives, and cleaning the church gives me pride, lets me know that I have a place at the university. The office in which I'm sitting must be spotless at all times, for it's the campus pastor's office. Even the top of the doorframe passes the white glove test. I know because Father Mustache checks it monthly. I check it weekly. Every item has its place in Father's office. Endless volumes of scriptural commentary and theology line the walls of the floor-to-ceiling bookshelves. Peering outward between the shelves is a medium-sized rectangular window whose vertical blinds hang open to the view of the decaying SAE house. At night, drunken frat boys can be seen pissing off their porch in the direction of the church, which irritates Father like a dust bunny under the altar. But I've observed that he doesn't stare at dust bunnies. <laughs> The bleached midday sun splits the blinds, throwing columns of light and shadow onto the small end table, which holds a wooden stand bearing a Bible open to Father's favorite passage, Sirach chapter 2. For fire is tested in gold and worthy men in the crucible of humiliation. Trust God and he will help you. Make straight your ways and hope in him. The black rocking chair on which I sit smells Murphy oil soap clean, but it creaks like a crow cawing at a trespasser. My tongue is dry, paralyzed behind my clenched jaw, tasting of stale soil and rust. My head droops. My eyes grow moist. From the stale scriptures, Sirach shames me, reminding me that I don't have a place in the church. Woe to craven hearts and drooping hands, to the sinner who treads a double path. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, and not into the hands of men. Father Mustache scribbles away at his desk, listening, listening to my wordless confession. On a caster-mounted black office chair, everything he owns is black, he sits and spins around on a transparent plastic floor shield to face his computer desk on the opposing wall. He's multitasking, probably working on a cunning homily or a presentation for the Archdiocesan Building Renovation Committee, something important. Really, I don't know what he does in here for 14 hours a day, even when school is out. I'd like to know. I'd like to know everything about what it is to be a priest, what it's like to be him. But what's the point? As soon as I confess, my vocational journey will end. I pull at the dark hair on my forearms. It's unruly, bestial. When did I get so hairy? I inhale to speak, but abort and pick at the frayed edge of my loose-fitting jorts. Nothing fits my skinny, bony, wimpy body. Father Mustache's egg-shaped head and its flame-like tuft of salt-and-pepper hair stare at the computer monitor. 
His short legs, small torso, and hanging belly are graced in their usual black clerics. His pianist's strong fingers, with their nod to the root fingernails, punch away at the keyboard like a nun desperate for menopause. Well, split it out, well, spit it, well, spill it out already, Pastrone. I hate the nickname that he's given me, but it does its magic. I tell him my sin. Something happened when I visited my childhood priest, Father Obaldi, last weekend. He'd invited me down after receiving my, I'm going to be a priest, and in large part thanks to your positive influence on my youth, letter. Father Obaldi warmly welcomed me and begged me to tell my life story. He was an old family friend who was present at my dad's bachelor party, where they watched stag movies. Wholeheartedly, I trusted him, even with the truth of the sexual abuse that I'd endured, and about being attracted to males. Father Obaldi told me there was nothing wrong with my attractions, stripped naked, and invited me to do the same. Confused and excited, I did. We gave each other massages, but never touched each other's genitalia. He was celibate, after all. Then we masturbated in front of each other. Father Mustache's fingers cease typing. He turns to me, his purple-bagged brown eyes piercing his glasses. The plastic floor protector crunches as his chair rumbles towards me. The warm, moist scent of his coffee tongue overpowers my nose, which is being prickled by his graying mustache. My body freezes. His stubby fingers dig into my bony knees. This is appropriate touch. His satin hands slide away from my knees, move up my hairy inner thighs, under the denim, and grasp onto my tidy whities my soft penis and balls, squeezing, hurting. This is inappropriate touch. I'm no longer in the church office celebrating confession. I'm in another rectangular room, smaller, brighter, purer, antiseptic. The paper under my bald 15-year-old bottom crinkles against the examination table. The spicy scented pediatrician's hand is on my penis. His salt and pepper mustache pricks my clenched lips. His tongue forces them apart, invading my mouth, my soul. The walls of denial tumble, each every movement of the slug-like tongue confirming the truth that I cannot, will not face. The genital exams of the past year were not standard procedure, but were sexual abuse. The pediatrician finishes before the nurse and my mother return. I sit, paralyzed, clothed in sticky lies and denial that will protect me from the reality until I'm in college and I trust someone enough to tell the truth. He's a mustached priest, my pastor, my boss, my spiritual director, my inspiration for wanting to be a priest, and my confessor. Ten months after telling him about the pediatrician, I sit in Father Mustache's office with his livid, repressed digits collaring my cock and balls. I'm frozen again, just as I was in the pediatrician's grasp. My dark eyelashes strain tears, letting them fall. I inhale. I'm sorry, Father. Please, please let go of me. He does. And then he absolves me of my sin. Palmer Strelly. is a second year student in MPW. And uh, bear with me on explaining this, uh, her, rite, her, her rite of passage. Uh, do you guys know the um, sorority uh, system or the sorority thing, Circle the Fat? Anybody Woo. heard of this? <laughs> okay, there's, someone really supports it. It's when uh, they make the girls who are trying to be in the sorority uh, strip down to their underwear and they take a big black magic marker and they circle the areas where they obviously have fat on them. It's very nice. So, uh, one time, Sharice uh, was down in Miami with a boyfriend and uh, went to a house party on Star Island thrown by Sean Combs, Puffy, Puff Daddy, Di Sean John Diddy. Uh, that's, that's P. Diddy now. I believe he dropped the P. He's just Diddy. Now. <laughs> but whatever, P. Diddy or Diddy. And uh, anyway, and so... Uh, they were in sort of the standby line, the uninvited guest line to try to get in. Uh, and it turns out that they were doing this, Circle the Fat, on the women 
in this line to get into the party. Uh, and so she's in the line, and she said to her boyfriend, uh, do you really want me stripping down and standing up like a piece of meat? And he responded, it's Diddy. <laughs> uh, so she did, and they got to the party, and they stayed for two days. <laughs> and that's her craziest rite of passage. Oh, no. Couldn't have been me, chap. Uh, so something you uh, didn't know about Charisse is that she's still terrified of the dark, and she sleeps with a stuffed Budweiser horse named Duke. <laughs> Please welcome Charisse Keck. This piece is called Sunday Morning, and it's a compilation of a larger work that I'm working on, um, Saturday nights that turn into Sunday mornings. Okay. We sat on the red leather sofa, staring at the blow on the coffee table. I peeled myself off the couch and regretfully looked in the mirror. For reasons always unknown, I was convinced that with divine intervention and years of accrued faith from the Catholic schooling in my childhood, my appearance would morph back to the fabulous girl that started the evening. At 5 a.m., the chances of fixing the national deficit were a lot more likely. <laughs> the, questions to the, que the answers to the questions people seek at that time of night are not in the mirror. They're on the mirror. Rail after rail, white powder, ready for an effortless flight up my nose. I peered at my reflection and looked but did not see. The silent image was shaking and distorted. There's no way I look that bad. In denial, I returned to my warm seat by the Blow Mountain and the vampires. Just so you know, nothing good ever comes out of staying up all night. It's a recipe for heartbreak, a bloody nose, and disaster. Guzzling booze plus chain smoking at nightclubs in LA equals withdrawing $200 from the ATM and blowing an eight ball. All of this, of course, is after you've spent at least $100 at the bar of some club. I personally always pay for my own drinks. That way I'm not obligated to hook up with an asshole. When you buy your own blow and booze, you don't owe anyone anything. None of my debauchery has ever been planned. I spontaneously make the call after a couple of cocktails. Too late for tears, at this time of night, I did another line. I let the remorse tingle down my throat with the drip of the blow. Soon, one would numb the other. To all of you who party, if you can avoid it, don't peek in the mirror and do an appearance check after 2 a.m. <laughs> it ruins the confluence of the group and fucks up the energy. Only look after you've done a few bumps in a nightclub stall. When I open a club, every stall will have a private mirror and sink. My guests will have sconed euphoric and extravagant. I'll even have a DJ to drown out the sniffing. There's nothing worse than exiting a stall looking like you've just stuck your face in a powdered donut. Everyone knows you're doing blow. When the club closes and you find yourself at an after party at some fabulous home in the Hollywood Hills, trust me when I say this. If you didn't look fantastic, you wouldn't be there. So again, no peeking in the mirror. The only exception to this rule is Luigi, the five-foot-tall Italian drug dealer that dresses like a mobster and looks like a goblin. I should take that back. He's actually a nice person. He sells blow late night at parties in the hills for the steep price of $80 a gram. The weird thing is he drives a really shitty car. It, it doesn't make sense to me because you know he could easily afford a nice one. The funny thing about that shitty car is it's always packed with gorgeous young girls looking to party. Beauty follows Blow all the way to the top of Mulholland Drive. These drug dealers that party in the hills, I think they do their own Blow. If you mix pleasure with the business of selling cocaine, the empire is going to crumble. Luigi knew about every hills party in the city. Sometimes he'd be a deer, and he'd call me earlier in the week to tell me about the good parties in advance. You know, like the pre-Golden Globe parties or Academy Award Hills parties. Those parties require a little more lead time when it comes to picking out the Saturday night ensemble. So I have a question for the late Pablo Escobar and all my friends. How come staying up all night doing drugs makes people dirty? Um, maybe because you're not supposed to put things up your nose? Let's go off on a little tangent here, shall we? People do that when they're high. It takes six hours to cover one topic with all the digressions. So here we go. Thanksgiving Eve is a big night out for people in LA. 
Thanksgiving dinner provides the perfect remedy for a hangover. <laughs> Nothing soothes a self-induced sore throat like mashed potatoes and gravy. Turkey's easy on the tummy as well. Someone told me that I'd be well on my way to recovery if I have protein after a bender. It's supposed to help rebuild your white blood cells or something. I never bothered to look that up, but it did stick with me and it does make sense. So Wednesday night quickly flowed into Thursday morning. By 9 a.m., the gravity of the situation set in. I broke my own rule. I did the appearance check and looked in the mirror. Gag, vomit, barf. I was frightening. When I spoke, it sounded like I had a severe sinus infection. That wasn't going to fly at my parents' house. My sisters definitely knew that colds for me don't materialize out of thin air after a night clubbing. I was in dire need of relief. So I consulted with one of the snowbird vampires. Terry, my good friend and high-profile litigation attorney, suggested Afrin, a nasal miracle. She told me to back off the lines for a few hours, take some Xanax, and I'd be fine by noon. I didn't want to argue with her, yet putting Afrin up my nose terrified me. It seemed unnatural. The vampire tent <laughs> shrieked with laughter. Wait a minute, you've just snorted a gram and you're scared to use Afrin? Clearly you know you're high and debilitated when you feel more comfortable using cocaine than nasal spray. <laughs> Another sign of complete loss of, inte complete loss of intelligence is when you volunteer to get in the car and drive to 7-Eleven to get more booze. Driving cracked out with my dark Gucci glasses, or dark Gucci sunglasses on at 6 to 5 a.m. is a very bad idea. Just, just let someone else go. I'd pay at least $300 a bottle for Pink Dot to bring me Grey Goose between the hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. Drug dealers should sell blow, vodka, and Xanax simultaneously. <laughs> Anyone feeling entrepreneurial? Drug scum sticks to your skin after a thousand showers. The stain on your soul is co-laced with the dark residue of cigarettes, alcohol, feudal sex, and blow. I see permanent fingerprints of dirty brown hands fondling my breasts. I can never wash them off. I'll admit, being the planner that I am, sometimes when you're too cracked out to return to the ATM and you only have 20, 20 bucks in your wallet, you compromise and you let Pablo fill up your shirt. For regular clients, little touchy-feely goes a long way. At that time, it's not as immediately costly as the $10,000 mistake of a DUI if you get caught driving. However, letting a drug dealer touch your special places in exchange for a gram that's going to have you hiding under the bed from the demons in your head isn't worth it. They always come for me. Once I cross the point of paranoid no return, I see spiders crawling all over my skin. I've spent hours hiding under the covers from dark black spiders that don't exist. I'm terrified of spiders. I had an abusive babysitter that used to lock me in a closet for indefinite periods of time. My parents traveled a lot when I was a kid. There was a spider in there once. I saw it before she closed the door. When my grandmother finally rescued me from that closet, my body was covered in bites. At a certain point in the evening, that spider always comes back for me. Drug abuse debits all dignity. Don't barter for blow. It bankrupts your soul. I have caution tape around the doors of many memories. But... In my experience, there are only four places on the planet where staying up for 110 hours is perfectly normal and you don't get paranoid. Everyone else is doing it, so why the hell not? Get a passport, because the cracked out and the fabulous all frequent Miami, Vegas, Ibiza, and Thailand. In this order, too. Mark your calendar. <laughs> Therese Keck. Next, we have Eric Rock, who is graduating this semester in fiction. Uh, and his uh, most interesting, craziest rite of passage was he pulled down his trousers and peed. Which is not, I also joined the Big Boys Pants Club. <laughs> That's good. And he likes girls with tattoos. Uh, and if you want to talk to uh, him about it later, he also wants everyone to know he's a musical robot. Eric Brock, Eric everyone. Brock. <laughs> I asked PT to try to be funny for me before I answer. That played out well. 
No, really, he actually offered to do uh, karaoke Ice Ice Baby for me before I came on. Or, uh, no, 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 it was uh, all 22 chambers of R. Kelly's Trapped in the Closet. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're serious. I actually, uh, we're serious. I do want to thank uh, a modern uh, literary genius for helping us have this all tonight. Um, you guys all saw Jennifer Love Hewitt is giving us the space. For the evening. <laughs> Round of applause. Thank you. Jen. Uh, so we're doing we're doing rites of passage tonight, and I figured I, this is not going to be funny. By the way. Uh, I figured there's no greater rite of passage than having someone not be in love with you anymore. I know, right? Thank, yeah, I know, I know. Um, and there's no there's no deeper lost love than a country song. So I've written for you guys a country song. Uh, it, it's called Blue Eyes Client Crying in the Rain. In the end, it's the locket that drives him to do it. Alvaro's sitting on the cliff in his Trans Am with the windows down and the radio locked in to the sound of tomorrow's country today. Just thinking and drinking with a case of Miller High Life riding shotgun in the passenger seat. The air's warm and the beer's cold. And Alvaro's getting drunk in the moonlight surrounded for miles by nothing but air and cicadas and acres of red dirt clay. He throws an empty out the window and looks at the damn locket again. She must have left it. Popping it open, he's face to face with her face and his. He sees her smile there and her eyes, so blue. You might think God himself took slices out of the sky and slipped them in. Eyes the color of a day that has never known a cloud or drop of rain. Alvaro twists the keys and when the engine turns over, he slips the car into reverse, spinning out from the clifftop and shooting into the night. A minute later, all that's left is a patina of hanging ash covering the view of the quiet, starlit town below. Now, TX-281 runs forever, starting just south of the state line at Wichita Falls. From there, it stretches all the way down to the border, where McAllen and Reynosa kiss up against each other like lovers through a window glass. Along the way, it passes through some sizable towns, Blanco for one in San Antonio. It's not but 30 miles from looking back at one spot, and past in 50 or so of Austin to Fort Worth. But mostly, it's just a four-lane split rural highway, straight as the trunk of an old field pine without a stoplight or an S-curve, surrounded by live oak and bunch grasses. Along its edges, little Burmy hills rise into the darkness, protecting the coyotes and cars from one another. And with the exception of the occasional white-tailed deer, there's not much to run into out there, and that's just as well, because with that locket in his hand, Alvaro screams up and down the 281 like a dust storm through ghost town, leaving in his wake nothing but the sound of his engine revving and powdered splinters the occasional shattered empty high life bottle. And that, along with a faint whiff of far off coal smoke, is the only thorn to poke at the serenity of this otherwise quiet central Texas night. When the station's off the air and the gas tank dwindles, Alvaro eases his car off the road, his anger abating some, his front bumper comes to rest at last against the trunk of an alligator juniper in a dirt lot. But he's not alone. He kills the headlights, still hazy with fury and beer, not realizing until he steps out of his car just where he stopped, the entrance to the county line. Alvaro takes a good long look at it, this roadhouse between San Saba and Lampasas that never fails to draw him in. Before he knows it, he's sucked in too, ass planted on a red vinyl stool like a raccoon on a porch, and staring at a row of bottles that all look like they're grinning at him. Music, loud, twangy, echoes through his ears, and a few other men mill about the bar. Barkeep! Alvaro raises a finger in the air, and a boy barely in his twenties, thick, with a blonde crew cut, walks up polishing a glass beer stein with a torn white cotton rag. Help you? Let me get a whiskey. Bartender shakes his head and gestures to the maple tabletop. You've already got a whiskey there, friend. Bartender turns and saddles away. Alvaro looks down to find he's right. There, in front of him, the shot glass full nearly to the brim with flannel liquor weights. He calls out after him, well then come on and put some whiskey in my whiskey. <laughs> when the bartender ignores him, this laughing drunk and a honky-tonk full of him, Alvaro ignores him right back, lifting the little cup, slow and unsteady to his lips. Alvaro recoils as the slit, slickly feel of rot gust coats his tongue, and he shudders as the drink slides down his pipes. It burns, and he winces and sucks in air through pursed lips. But when the pain passes, he licks his mouth and exhales hard, reveling in the feeling of pale fire that rumbles toward his belly. 
He swivels around on his cushion and takes a good eyeful of the band. They're doing old Willie and doing him pretty well at that. Whiskey River, take my mind. The band leader sings. Don't let a memory torture me. Amen, Alro nods. Only way to end low sorrows is to kill him off with drowning. Whiskey River, don't run dry. Oh, ha, ha, you're all I've got. Take care of me. Alvaro's following along, keeping time with his foot on the brass rung of the stool as he checks the floor. Boys have their stetsons tipped forward on their heads, and the ladies' jeans, tucked way down into their boots, dart in and out between the men's legs. The motion, the music soothe them, and Alvaro nearly starts to unwind. Nearly. Until he catches sight of something that makes his stomach clench. Right out there, in a cute white dress with flowers sewn on, is a woman pretty enough to stop your heart. Creamy skin, blonde hair, Eleanor Caroline. His Eleanor Caroline. He can see her plain as day, and she's out there on the floor twirling hand in hand with some dark-haired son of a bitch. <laughs> a light-skinned fellow wearing a red button-down shirt and a pair of Wranglers. The kind of shit-eating smile that's just begging for a fist to turn it around. <laughs> Alro doesn't even tilt his head back. Rage freezes him like he'd stepped into a nest of snakes. He just opens his mouth and, with eyes transfixed on the dance floor, yells out as loud as he can manage. Bartender! The dirty cop hits the bottom of a metal sink. Give me another one. He watches as the song winds down. Eleanor Caroline glowing white in the crowd and doesn't look away until the clink of glass on tabletop demands his attention. Alvaro turns just in time to see the bartender walking away from him again. He looks down and, on the counter, more whiskey's waiting. He wraps his hand around it, feeling his veins throbbing blood. Damn, but he's holding it tight. And Alvaro takes a shot, fast, slamming it back down onto the bar top where it lands with a crack. He can hear his own breath. The bartender, still holding the bottle, turns around. He looks Alvaro straight in the eye. First time he's looked at him squarely since he walked in. Don't go breaking my glasses now, he says. And without even waiting for a response, he turns and starts walking away. Alvaro smiles crookedly, one end of his lip listing off to the side. Yes, sir. Eyes still on the bar keeps back, he picks up the shot again, chasing the stubborn few drops left clinging to the bottom. And once he takes them down, Alvaro throws the empty glass as hard as he can against the corrugated iron wall. That does it. Alvaro stands, ready now to set things straight, but the bartender's already thrown his towel down onto the rubber mat and hopped up over the rail. Before Alvaro's three steps toward the dance floor, the bartender's got him by the wrist, and within seconds his arm is chicken wing behind his back, and he's being hustled out the door. People in the parking lot scoot out of the way just in time for Alvaro to hit the dirt, and he barely gets his hands up to protect his face. With his arm hugging tight to the remains of his high life and his ass back on the trunk of his car, Alvaro looks up at the moon, barely visible now amongst the clouds that have somehow snuck across the Texas skyline. As they cover the stars, a wet wind starts picking up, which is odd. Hill country doesn't usually see much rain after the spring storms pass. But Alvaro feels a chill across the dark skin of his wrists, and he knows one's on its way. And that rain that's coming, it's just one more thing to remind of Eleanor Caroline. They'd been out at the lake the summer before, and she was gorgeous. In her neon green bikini top and little blue jean shorts, she looked as beautiful as she'd ever been. They got caught in a sudden shower standing at the water's edge, and as the rain beat down on the piddling wake waves that lapped gently at the shore, she kissed him and said she was his forever, and he believed her, which just makes it hurt all the more. Alvaro slips off the trunk and gets back in his car. With the door still open, he cracks the glove compartment and breaks the aridosol choked night air with his lonesome voice. I love the girl. He sings, the leader now of his own sad band. <laughs> she was my sunshine. He rifles past the registration and expired insurance papers, his hand searching the glove box. His name was Eleanor Caroline. Pulls out a cardboard case and a cold hunk of metal. He knows what he's got to do. She got fast with a friend of mine. Throws another empty into the night. At the dance hall, oh Lord, on the county line. Alvaro opens the box and tips its contents into his hand. 
waterfall of bullets spills forth. So I put some whiskey into my whiskey. I put some heartbreak into my heart. He fumbles three bullets up off the floor and reaches for his handgun. A real one, not a sister revolver, a magnum. And begins loading the clip. I put my boots on that old dance floor. He rams the clip home and slams the car door shut. I put three rounds lower in my 44. That'd have been of all right if the bartender just let him go stomp that new boot, or if he hadn't tossed him the ground. But he didn't, and now Alvaro's got to take it all the way. Because cuckolding and humiliation, that's too much for any man to bear. Dirt gives way to the crush of peanut shells on cement and the soft slide of sawdust on pine as Alvaro slides back in. No one's seen him, or and if they have, they've not paid him any mind. Fingering his waistband like a security blanket, he watches the couples twirl on the wood shavings. Some go cheek to cheek, with palms pressed chastely against each other. Others dip and sway, saddled in real close. The love in the air is manifest, and between the blue light, the song, and the heat, Halvaro's heart nearly softens. But just as he's about to turn, just as he's about to give it up and head on home, he sees them. He sees them both. And after that, there's no going back. They got their bodies right up against each other. No room for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> They're gazing into each other's faces, swaying back and forth, and the world dissolves into a sea of boiling red. Alvaro elbows his way through the masses, coming to rest right behind Eleanor Caroline, just as the band says they're taking a break. And as the boys pack their instruments away and the crowd starts thinning off the floor, Alvaro claims his due. What he's going to say, he doesn't know till he says it. He half surprises himself when he opens his mouth. I filled my glass with Uncle Jack. He warbles out his own love story. There's a gasp and it's Eleanor Caroline. I lay my skin in my Sunday black. She recoils, horrified. A drop step back like in a dance, but Alvaro follows by stepping forward. I'll make my bed, he sings. On them railroad tracks. The house lights come up. And Eleanor Caroline's new man shows his fist bald and ready. But Alvaro doesn't care. He keeps right on singing. I leave this world, Lord, and I won't look back. And out comes the gun. The silver plating catches a glint of light. And in an instant, a scream shoots through the walls of the county line. Again, the world dissolves. People hiding behind tables invisible, non-existent now. And all that's left are Alvaro and Eleanor Caroline, and the Johnny Come Lately, and the 44. It's Alvaro's show now. And with the business end of the Magnum, he leads them all up to the stage. He's got a pistol in one hand and grabs the microphone with the other, wincing as the metal connects with his fresh, dirty cut. I put some whiskey into my whiskey. Stay hard, cuckolding and humiliation. I put some heartbreak into my heart. The man standing before Alvaro, the dead man standing before him, who just seconds ago was kissing his girl, holds his hand in the air, contrite, palms forward. I made my way across that old dance floor. Put three rounds, Lord, my Eleanor. And he unlocks the trigger guard. Eleanor Caroline's eyes meet his, pleading. And Alvaro swims in those deep pools of blue he's known for so long. A color in them changes. The moment's tense. Her new boyfriend takes her in his arms. Finally, the storm breaks. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alvaro whispers, and he drops the microphone to the floor. And outside, lightning flashes. That rare summer deluge striking down the telephone pole. And inside, everyone hears the crash. Thanks.
Eric Rock. Oh, all right. Uh, before we do our have our last reader come up, uh, we're going to speak a little bit about what I hinted at earlier, which was uh, that fundraising thing that we're going to be doing for help to help the MPW students go to the AWP conference in Denver. We have three signed copies of the novel Push, uh, signed by Sapphire, and you all probably know that this is now the award-winning film Precious, and we are raffling these off. So if you're interested in acquiring a copy, uh, see Jackie Lazo. Jackie, raise your hand after the reading, and you can uh, cook that up with her. Starting at $15. $15 is what we're starting at. If you want to make a really exorbitant bid for it, you can probably go ahead and do that and just get it right away. Otherwise, I think they're going to do an auction, right? Over email? Is that what it is? Uh, so, f to uh, conclude our reading, um, this is our, uh, our special faculty guest uh, for tonight is Coleman Huff, who teaches screenwriting uh, in the MPW program. However, uh, she will be reading uh, prose pieces uh, under the, the general theme of Rites of Passage uh, that she's been working on, uh, which also mixes in some poetry as well, I believe. Is that right? And in terms of rites of passage, uh, Coleman says that the year she left the children's table and got to sit next to her uncle Bobo was pretty significant. Uh, and something that few people know about Coleman is that she wrote for a website called lovetrack.com and was their dating expert. Uh, and the advice is still on the site, so you can check it out. It's love.track. I'm oh, sorry, love-track.com. All the stuff's under finding your soulmate. So, if you're interested. She also wrote the screenplays for Full Frontal and Bubble, both directed by Steven Soderbergh. Please put your hands together for Coleman Hunt. Hey. So, Rites of Passage. It's really fun to think about what I was going to read. This is called Billy, Lin Billy Lincoln. Tuesday mornings late, the summer I was 11, a boy named Billy Lincoln worked in my grandmother's yard. He mowed the lawn first thing, and I always woke up to its jagged moan. I could see him from my window and positioned myself to watch him. He was pale and small-boned, but tall. I watched him handle the coil of the garden hose, his long, thin arms spooled it around the jut of his elbow. The way I'd seen my father wind the, wind the frosted-colored lights after Christmas. Then Billy hooked it on the fence and leaned over to turn on and leaned over to turn off the water without bending his knees. A darkness spread, a slow stain beneath his thin gray shirt. I got close enough to smell him most Tuesdays after lunch. He'd come in for iced tea and a check. Sometimes my grandmother would have it written out beside his glass, but I counted on the times that she would have forgotten. Those days, she would leave me alone with Billy and his long fingers wrapped around the sweat of iced tea. He would tell me how he really was an exotic dancer in a low sing-song voice. He danced with snakes. His skin was smooth, buffed down, and white by the bellies of all those snakes. I thought of Tuesday afternoons as our time. His wink out of each eye meant, goodbye, don't tell your grandmother. <laughs> and I didn't. For a while she thought he was deaf and would tell me after he'd gone the story of how her mother had fallen in love with a deaf boy during the First World War. Well, this is before I even knew there had been two wars, but I knew Billy Lincoln was not deaf. He had big ears and could wiggle them. I tried to wiggle mine, but he told me it came with practice. He said he had the look of someone who practiced many things. On Tuesday, I asked him if he played the piano. He sat down at the baby grand and played out the maple leaf rag. We were about to play a duet when my grandmother came back in the room, gave Billy a look, and handed him his check. After that day, she must have figured out he wasn't deaf. And Billy stopped coming by for iced tea. Coming in for iced tea, my grandmother took it out to him instead. It's best, she had said when I asked her about it. We don't want to get too familiar. She thought people got the wrong ideas about things, and before they could, she usually changed the subject. She was an expert at rearranging the direction of any conversation. It's just good sense. 
She would say, and most of the time I like the way that sounded, but when Billy Lincoln stopped talking low to me on those Tuesday afternoons, I felt like she was standing over me at the beach, blocking my light. Oops. Just gonna get this a little further away from my, okay. You want it further away? Like up a little. Thanks, let's go, yeah. Every Halloween, my mother was the neighborhood's famous witch. She'd put on a long red wig, darken her teeth, and wear a long black cape and pointy hat. She would come to our school and throw candy around like she was feeding the chickens. She'd reach into her plastic pumpkin and pull out fistfuls of sugar babies, sweet tarts, candy corn. My sister and I were celebrities at Halloween. Everyone knew who we were. Knew our mother and was scared to death of her. She'd cackle and grab children randomly, pull them, <laughs> pull them to her and pretend to cast a spell. Hello, my precious. Are you a little cat? Spin the hair of a dog, pinch the tail of a rat. Come here, young prince. Never step on a crack. If you do, then you're bound to break your mother's back. <laughs> the younger kids cried. The older kids avoided her. My sister and I rode home with her. Before sleep, my mother would fly in, land at the edge of my bed, stiffen her evening clothes, her skin cool, tight against my cheek, as if she were custard chilled in a china cup. She would press her fragrant face on one side or another of my neck, just behind my hair, lean in to whisper, brownish tastes on her tongue, exotic, not my mother at all, but the weight of her, the sudden flight perfuming the darkness that followed her out. Don't be ridiculous. This is what was my mother's first response to an alarm or tragedy. As if the, those syllables can somehow save us. Rede, rede, rede. I feel comforted by it, though. Once I thought I had the flu and was bed, in bed for a week. I thought I had the flu. I thought I had the flu, and my head was exploding, and I was so nauseous I couldn't move. It's falling off. My thoughts wandered one afternoon to a member of the wedding and that little boy who died of a headache. He died of meningitis. Mom, I called her, I think I have meningitis. Don't be ridiculous. There was an epidemic going around some college campuses near where I lived at the time. The next night I went to an emergency room and had a spinal tap, viral meningitis. Not the deadly kind, but still. Don't be ridiculous, she's saying it again. I'm 11 and run into her room at 2 a.m. saying there's a man trying to break into our house. After saying it, she flies downstairs and open, throws open the door to the back porch, shapes her hand into a gun and says, stop right there, I've got a gun on you. The man jumps over our garden wall and runs away. The World Trade Center has a smoking hole in it. My mother is in, Maine, in North Carolina with a t without a television, getting ready for the movers who take her to Maine. I think she'll find this fascinating, I call her. She's always calling me about what's on Oprah or the Today Show. She hates that I never watch daytime television. This morning though, the Today Show, since I wanted to hear the weather, Mom, they think a plane hit one of the World Trade Center towers. Don't be ridiculous. And then the explosion. My eyes were not fast enough to see the plane hit the building. I just saw the ball of fire, and I dropped the phone. God. You'll never be an actress. You have a thick waist. This was my father's prediction in 1985. The year I moved to New York, become an actress. I was 23, already an experienced waitress. I was ready. <laughs> or was I? I had a thick waist. So New York, 1985, high up in an office on 42nd Street and 8th Avenue, I sat across from an old man. I thought I was networking. <laughs> but it was all legit since it was connected to the Actors Project, this cult that I had recently joined, <laughs> that offered seminars with casting directors and resume services. <laughs> Headshot advice. Job opportunities were available, so I partook. I'd responded to an ad I'd seen on the bulletin board, photographer seeks catalog models. I called the number and got an interview. Wow. The old man who greeted me didn't seem like a photographer. I imagined a young, hip, long-haired, sort of beefy guy with a firm handshake. Remove your clothes except for your bra and underwear and I'll measure you. Fine. Well, he was older than my father. He was bald. So I thought it was all just fine. I worked as a typesetter in Queens or as a receptionist for a technical magazine 
or waitress at the Lone Star Cafe, whatever it was, I wanted out of it. I saw this as a way, so taking my clothes off did not seem unreasonable. He didn't say, take your clothes off and dance. He said, no, take your clothes off except for your bra and underwear and I'll measure you. I needed to be measured. <laughs> I like that. To be sure, there was still some dimensions to me, some still some weight. He seemed to concentrate on all the degrees of me. I liked his rever the reverence in his breath, his soft, fluttery tone, as if I made him slightly nervous. Could have, I could have picked him up and thrown him around the room. It would have been that easy. I felt strong, in control. He wrote down everything. So I'm sitting there buttoning my blouse in his office on 42nd Street, and he's adding up or subtracting. I don't know, but he's definitely doing the math. <laughs> and after a long silence, he looks up and says, you are perfectly proportioned. You'll be modeling laundry and toys. <laughs> wait, wait, laundry and toys? I pictured myself in a lazy bra holding up a doll I destroyed when I was five. <laughs> the doll had two faces, one on each side with two kinds of hair. One side was a smiling redhead with freckles, and when you flipped it over, the other was a frowning blonde with a tear stitch under her eye. <laughs> It was one of those cruel presents some friend of my mother's had given my sister and me to share. My sister had red hair. Uh, we had a room divided by blonde-headed dolls and red-headed dolls. This doll, however, disturbed us, caused fights, encouraged fits of rage. One night, Mom, after she turned off the light, I waited until my sister was asleep, waited until the house was quiet, and then, with scissors in hand, I flipped over to the other side and snipped off the hair, strand by strand, the red hair. Then the, red, the blonde was so complex, troubled at such a young age, she did not need a tear stitch under her eye. So I cut that off too. <laughs> Here's my card. Just check in from time to time and I'll let you know when there's work. The ball man winked at me. Lingerie and toys. I thought about it the whole way home. You are perfectly proportioned. But I had a thick waist. <laughs> My mother beguiles, conducts waves of laughter, rides the momentum of joy. She's a giant child ordering happy on the menu that comes cooked in a variety of ways. My father watches her from his stillness, fascinated by how she moves, pulling him along to her red lipstick events. There's the christening and the luncheon and the concert series. Oh, they're wonderful, she says. The sun wakes me to my chair. I, I lick jelly from the corner of my mouth. My mother and I, alone on Adirondacks, her, de her deck, our breakfast, my silence. Her question still floats above us. What have you done to serve mankind? It seems rehearsed, her, her cadence. I shift. She says it again, same lilt, same implication. I don't answer right away. Good coffee, I say. She adds, your sister had heads about three to four cherries in Hong Kong. She cuts ribbons and goes to boat ceremonies where she breaks all kinds of bottles against a ship. I stare at my mother, languid, lounging, long-figured in her terry robe, royal feet, obedient, obedient, full of free, free of flaw. My answer is sputtery. I'm a writer, she interrupts. No, to serve. I have nothing she wants. Stand behind my answer, open, eyes open and shielded by my writer hand. She clears the dishes and goes inside. I had a dream about my genitals sliding out like a piece of chewing gum, plop into a toilet of swampy waters. Imagine my surprise as I stood there naked since my underwear had been complex, necessary to remove and my dress, the organdy layers fanning up at me, laughing from a hook at my face, looking down at the pink fallen flesh, floating there, weighty. And then, the automatic flush. <laughs> Saving myself the way one would do, I reached down and caught it in my hand, washed it off in the sink, patted it dry. I thought it would be easy to fit back in, that it would click into place like my diaphragm behind a bone. But what I couldn't tell was which was the front and which was the back, and where did it really go? Details I would certainly soon remember. So I wrapped it up in toilet paper, put it in my purse, and dressed without it, returning to the party flushed, unsexed, 
invisible, clutching my purse in a crowd. I wandered around drinking cheap, cheap champagne, trying to find a doctor I could ask if this was something I should have expected. I wanted a scientific answer. No one had warned me, not even my mother, the queen of menopause, goddess of the change. Someday your genitals will just drop down. <laughs> you could be anywhere, so be prepared. I carry an airtight container with me just in case, and darling, you should as well. <laughs> it happens any time after 41. She could have offered practical advice. I would have accepted it with grace and poise, hot flashes, thinning hair, fallen genitals, your most creative time. Is all she had said. Menopause and the mystery was for me to discover like sex. Something beautiful, the way she described it when I was eight. Sex that was now in my lipstick. Sex, sex that was now in my purse with lipstick and car keys, credit card receipts, money. Items I may have lost or forgotten, stolen, borrowed, reclaimed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Once again, call them hot. And another round of applause for all the readers tonight. Uh, and before, uh, before we go, uh, we'd like to also do a special thank you to William Brown of Barnes & Noble, The Grove here, for helping us set up and for your fantastic hosting. Um, just for a couple of upcoming events uh, to let you guys know about. Um, next, this is next week, right? I'm bad with dates. Okay, good. Uh, next, uh, next week on Friday and Saturday, you got little postcards on this on your seat, is the 2010 NPW Writing for Stage and Screen Festival. Uh, three, uh, three students in our program uh, will have staged readings of, uh, of uh, well, stage and screen writing <laughs> that um, that will be uh, performed, uh, and, and a winner will be chosen on Saturday. Uh, the the students are Kevin Avery, Marlene Leach, and Tom Restrelli, who read tonight, right over there. Uh, so you can make that out. Um, that is uh, on the USC campus in Mark Taper Hall. And the next, um, and I believe last for the semester, uh, student reading series um, like like this. The installment is going to be uh, Friday, April sixteenth. Uh, at Skylight Books up in uh, Los Feliz on Vermont. Uh, it will no longer be amateur hour here with the two of us hosting. <laughs> Tom and Rakina will be back. Uh, and the theme is going to be the art of memory weaving the past. Did I get that right? Something like that. Something like that. Uh, you come, it'll be a surprise. And, uh, and, you'll, and you'll show up. Um, and, uh, thank you all so thank much, you all much for coming. Out. Parking and cookies in the back. All right, thank you so much, everyone.